By this point in my life as a PC builder, I built close to a dozen with custom loops. Now, I'm certainly not the best at it and my designs don't please everyone, it's inevitable, this is the internet, but I've learned quite a bit from my experiences uh, regarding tube bending, flow order, and radiator config. So I want to focus on a couple of those in this video today because I received a request from a fellow viewer in the comment section of one of my previous videos. His question essentially was, how many radiators do you need, how do you know how many you need, and what will happen if you don't? have enough of them. So let's answer that question today. So I actually have some personal experience with custom loops lacking sufficient rad space and not only that, I've got experience with rads lacking sufficient airflow. There is a difference between the two and you'll know uh, based on the symptoms. So as you might imagine, any closed loop without enough airflow and radiator surface area will incur excessive heat buildup. The liquid in the loop, mostly water, doesn't have magical dissipation powers. It may have a relatively high heat capacity, but it'll try to equalize much like any other medium. My general rule of thumb is to allocate at least one 120 millimeters of diagonal rad space that looks something like this per processing unit. So that's per graphics card and per CPU. For example, a standard one CPU, one GPU config that's most builds I imagine will require at least one of these. That's a single 240 mil radiator. It would look really weird to put two 120s in a custom loop independently, but I guess you could do that too. Now, if the pump is especially weak, it might not be enough still. DDC's D5 pumps are plenty, don't worry. Uh, but if you spliced both the CPU and the GPU into a single AIO config, like with this one right here from Deepcool, then this pump in here is probably not gonna be enough. And the same goes for most Asa Tech pumps out there. So pump speed up to a certain threshold, yes, does make a difference. If you're not pulling heat fast enough away from your units, then they will overheat, your entire loop will. Uh, and radiator surface area is another factor to consider, but these aren't the only ones. Fan placement, RPM, and access to fresh air should all be considered as well. I can speak to these firsthand. Do you remember my Andromeda custom loop build? That's actually my favorite build to date from an aesthetic standpoint. It was severely crammed. That was something I liked about it, but it also meant that it was starving for airflow. So notice the positions of these fans here. They were actually placed outside the fractal defined C chassis, meaning they only had about two or three centimeters of breathing room, which is simply not enough. It's not recommended. I don't recommend you do this um, and I thought it would be okay at least for some light gaming and, and editing Of course the graphics cards aren't gonna be you know working that hard when you're editing and it proved to be just fine for that uh, And some light gaming I could get away with but when it went you know when it came to a, a really heavy intensive game Where both the GPUs and the CPU were all being utilized pretty heavily This uh, simply was not enough. There was not enough air being introduced into the case to uh, keep the, the fluid temps down especially, but the, the entire system as a whole, every unit was overheating. Yeah, not recommended. But in combination with a 360 mil rad, is a copper rad from Alpha Cool, 30 mil thick. Look, that was fine. Um, and I'd say that, you know, if I did that again, it would be okay. I just had to emphasize airflow more than I actually did in there. So SLI GTX 1080s and a 6700 K all overclocked definitely wouldn't hold up in this one. I actually had to downclock everything back to stock to keep those temperatures in check. And even then I'm pretty sure my fluid temperatures were bridging into some uh, uncharted and uncomfortable territories. That's something else I wanna to touch on, fluid temperatures. The water in your loop shouldn't generally exceed, I would say, 40 degrees Celsius. You could probably get away with a bit more, but some pretty bizarre things start to happen in the mid to high 40s. I can attest to these again firsthand. This is all just one big learning experience for me. First, pumps can be permanently damaged, and these aren't cheap components by any means. Since they rely on liquids in the loops to cool the bearings, not DDC pumps in this case, but D5 pumps in particular, any T delta higher than roughly 10 to 15 degrees of room temperature can substantially reduce reduce the transferable properties of the water. The conduction equation, which solves for the rate of heat transfer, that's Q over T generally between two mediums, it indicates that temperature deltas are the driving forces of this rate of heat transfer. If the difference is pretty small, you know, everything else constant, then the resulting numerator is smaller and the resulting rate of heat transfer is lower. These are directly proportional. If the difference between T1 and T2 is higher, then the numerator is bigger and thus QT is bigger. Conduction isn't the only force that play in a system like this, but it does get my point across and it is something to consider. A hot pump is no good pump. For example, I prematurely concluded here that Primo Chill revolver fittings did this to my PEGG tubing. However, what I ended up finding out later was that the 7900X, that's the i9 Intel CPU that will fry eggs guaranteed in Walter White version 3, was dumping far too much heat into the loop with the overclock I was running. It was like 4.7 or 4.8 gigahertz. In the short run, temperatures were fine, but as discussed in this video right here, custom loop 
loops and AIOs require lengthy torture tests before the temperatures of the liquids in them fully equalize. In a nutshell, with this one, I underestimated the amount of heat the CPU ended up dumping into the loop, hence the softening of the PETG and strange warping you're seeing here. What I want you to take away from this, custom loops are not the easiest things to tackle and you'll have to consider several variables per build. Um, even the simplest things though, you don't want to overlook, especially like with the number of rads and you know the amount of airflow you have in your case and fluid temperatures, TDPs, all of that. So make sure you consider all of those factors before you jump into a build like this one because uh, it's going to really suck if it ends up not being a fully stable system in the long run, especially after torture testing the thing because you found out you didn't include enough radiators or maybe you're using too weak a pump or you just have too much in there and it's just heating the liquid up too much that uh, yeah, heat's not being dissipated quick enough. And if you don't have enough rad support space in your chassis, then that means you gotta change your case and yeah, the rabbit hole never ends. That's custom loops in general though, and that's kind of why I like them. They're blank slates, you can really get creative with these builds and make them look unique, but there are again, several factors to consider. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. I appreciate that thumbs down for the opposite. Click the subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for more content like this. This is Science Studio, thanks for learning with us.